and welcome to Dove Biology Apes Lessons to Go. In this video, we'll be exploring marine life zones. Marine ecosystems provide many ecological services from climate moderation to nutrient cycling and waste treatment. They are a source of habitat and nursery areas for organisms, as well as being a great source of genetic resources and biodiversity. Additionally, they play many economic services, from being a source of food and pharmaceuticals, being a mechanism for transportation and recreation, as well as being a major source of oil and natural gas. As a result, they provide $21 trillion in goods and services each year, actually 70% more than terrestrial ecosystems. Unfortunately, these marine systems are poorly understood. Some say we actually know more about the surface of the moon. Now, marine aquatic systems are huge reservoirs of biodiversity with many different ecosystems. Marine life will be found in three major life zones, the coastal zone, the open sea, and the ocean bottom. The coastal zone is the warm, nutrient-rich shallow water that will extend from the high tide mark on land to the gently sloping shallow edge of the continental shelf. Now, while the coastal zone makes up less than 10% of all the world's ocean area, it actually contains 90% of all marine species. This is due to the fact it's a very productive area, as a result of being able to access ample sunlight and receiving plant nutrients directly from the land. Unfortunately, these coastal areas are subject to a great deal of human disturbance. It is on the coast where we see a lot of development for our homes and uh, places to shop. It's a major area for recreation, and it's the first stop for pollutants that are coming from the land. Two major ecosystems that we'll find near the coast are going to be estuaries and coastal wetlands. Estuaries are where the rivers meet the sea. Estuaries and their associated wetlands include river mouths, inlets, bays, sounds, and salt marshes in temperate zones, and the mangrove forest in the tropical zones. These areas are very nutrient-rich and highly productive. Another important component of coastal biodiversity are seagrass beds. Seagrasses are highly productive plants that grow in those shallow coastal waters. They will support a variety of marine species, and they help to stabilize the shoreline by reducing the impact of waves. Now, life is harsh in these coastal ecosystems. Organisms must be adapted to changes in tide, uh, changes in river flow, temperature changes, and changes in salinity, as well as uh, runoff that's coming from the land, which is bringing additional sediments and pollutants that will impact their environments. These estuaries and coastal marshes will provide many ecological and economic services. For one, they filter toxic pollutants, excess plant nutrients, and sediments that are coming from the land. They are able to reduce storm damage by absorbing waves and storing excess water that would be produced by storms and tsunamis. They are an excellent source of food, habitats, and nursery sites for many aquatic species. In the United States, the Chesapeake Bay is going to be the largest estuary. It spans 64,000 square miles, covering parts of six states, Delaware, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. There's over 17 million people that actually live in this area. Now today, the bay and its tributaries are in poor health, with polluted water, low populations of fish and shellfish, degraded habitats and landscapes that have been lost to development. In recognition of this, President Obama issued an executive order in 2009 to protect and restore this important area. In the order, the President declared the Chesapeake Bay a national treasure and ushered in a new era of federal leadership, action, and accountability to protect and restore the health, heritage, natural resources, and social and economic value of our nation's largest estuarine ecosystem and the natural sustainability of its watershed. Life in these coastal areas are greatly influenced by tides. It is the gravitational pull by the moon and the sun that causes the tides in the coastal areas. 
Since the moon is close to the Earth, it has a strong gravitational pull on it, as closer objects have stronger gravitational pull. The moon pulls on the water on the side nearest to it more strongly than it pulls on the center of the Earth. As a result, this pull creates a bulge of water, called a tidal bulge, on the side of the Earth facing the moon. The water on the side of the Earth facing away from the moon has a less strong pull. As a result, this left-behind water forms a second bulge. In places where there are tidal bulges, high tide is occurring along the coastlines. In places between the bulges, we have low tide occurring. Most seashores have tides four times a day, two high tides and two low tides. A change from low tide to high tide or vice versa takes about six hours and 12 minutes. As you can see in this time lapse photo, the tidal rise and fall over a period of six and a half hours. During the next six hours of ebb, the fishermen can unload their boats on the dock. Spring tides occur two times a month, during a full moon and a new moon when the earth, sun, and moon are lined up. Spring tides are higher and lower than normal tides. This is due to the fact that both the moon and the sun are pulling um, in the same direction on the earth's surface. Neap tides occur in between spring tides at the first and third quarters of the moon, when the sun and moon are pulling at right angles to each other. As a result, neap tides are not as high as normal tides. They're typically what we call a weak tide. Now the area of shoreline between the low and high tide is called the intertidal zone. Organisms in this intertidal zone have developed specialized adaptations to deal with daily changes in temperature, salinity, and wave action. Many of them have specialized structures which allow them to hold on to the various substrates. They may dig into the sand or they may hide in protective shells. Now some coasts actually have barrier islands. These are low, narrow, sandy islands that will form offshore. The presence of piles of sand called dunes on the gently sloping sandy barrier beaches will actually protect the land from erosion by the sea. The dunes are maintained by grasses or shrubs. As a result of intensive recreation or uh, building, these uh, barrier islands can be degraded, which is going to diminish their ability to perform their function. Right on the edge of our continental shelf, we might find coral reef systems. Coral reefs are formed by coral polyps in warm tropical and subtropical coastal waters. These reef systems are highly productive areas that are home to a quarter of all marine species. The reef perform many ecological functions. They protect 15% of the world's coast from erosion, and they're able to moderate carbon dioxide levels from the atmosphere through the formation of the carbonate skeletons of the coral organisms. Now, as we leave uh, the coast and head off into the open ocean, we're going to see a sharp increase in depth at the edge of that continental shelf. It is here that we separate the coastal zone from the open ocean, also called the pelagic zone. On the basis of sunlight, the open sea is divided into three zones, the euphotic zone, the bathal zone, and the abyssal zone. The euphotic or epipelagic zone is the brightly lit surface part of the open ocean. Here, nutrient levels are typically low, but dissolved oxygen is high as a result of wave action and wind. Photosynthesis is capable to occur here because of the presence of sunlight. The only limitation is how much nutrients will be available at a given time. If we leave the euphotic zone and dive a little bit deeper, we'll enter into the bathal zone. This is the dimly lit middle layer of the ocean, sometimes called the twilight zone. Here, photosynthetic activity is minimized by the absence of light. Zooplankton and fish will live here and then migrate to the euphotic zone to feed at night when there's less chance of predation. As we near the bottom of the ocean, we'll enter into the abyssal zone. Here it's very cold and there's very little dissolved oxygen. 
organisms will survive on marine snow, which is the dead material and detritus that is falling from above. Or they may exist around hydrothermal vents, which are belching forth rich organic material, inorganic material, which certain organisms can turn into carbohydrates through the action of chemosynthesis. Now, the average net primary productivity per unit area of the open ocean is actually very low. Because the ocean is so large, though, it does contribute greatly to the Earth's overall productivity. Now, some areas will have higher net primary productivity as ocean currents and winds bring nutrients from the bottom to the surface. This is called an upwelling. When nutrients from the bottom rise up to the surface, where light is present, those organisms then can have a great increase in number, which then will provide the basis for the food chain for other organisms. Typically in these areas where there's upwellings, we find a lot of fishing opportunities. Now humans have impacted these marine systems in many different ways. Urban and industrial development are destroying and degrading many of the ecological and economic services provided by the world's coasts. Damage by divers' boat anchor anchors will destroy the fragile coral. Increasing ocean temperatures have actually caused bleaching or the loss of symbiotic algae that helps to provide food for the coral polyp. Dredging and trawling by fishermen can damage ocean bo bottoms, pulling up the important seagrasses that stabilize coastal zones and disrupting habitats for organisms. Finally, we see a decrease in the pH of oceans as they become more acidic. Ocean acidification is occurring due to the uptake of anthropogenic carbon dioxide. Uh, as carbon dioxide gets dissolved in the water, it forms carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. This acidification uh, weakens the shells of shellfish and coral, which then further disrupts ecological communities. Since the ocean is a great uh, resource both for ecological and economic functions, it is important for us to understand the nature of each of these unique ecosystems so that we can uh, conserve them and make sure that they are sustained well into the future.